Thanks, Judy. This is going to be a real test. So, when I say I want you to listen carefully, you have to for two reasons. Firstly, it's riveting. Secondly, otherwise you won't hear me. Actually, look, my voice went through the husky, sexy stage yesterday. <coughs> All you're left with is Donald Duck. Um, look, look, I really appreciate being invited. I have many happy memories of Aspen. And um, you can tell my era because names like uh, Peter Martin came to, and I'm great to see Peter here and, and Harvey. And here's the era of Ken Fraser and uh, Andrew Blair. But um, I'm going to show you what my school data um, is telling us about Australia's schools, including Victoria. And I'm going to do something really weird. I'm going to start with my conclusion. And it reads like this. <clears throat> We all have to reverse policies which widen the gaps between schools. Policies which mock our rhetoric about equity. In particular, we must seriously commit to funding on need. Local public schools should be funded so that they all become a real and active choice for all families. That's my conclusion today. But that's exactly how I concluded a talk to VASP seven years ago. <clears throat> the point is, not much has improved in Australia in that time. It was supposed to, but it didn't. So my observation seven years ago still holds up. There are two promising things didn't happen. I'll try not to say anything starting with a P, okay? <laughs> so, um, two, two promising did, things did happen. We had the Gonski Review, and around the same time we had a volcano called My School that spewed forth data about schools. These two events were game changers because Gonski's lasting achievement was that everybody started talking about equity and in broad terms are still committed to it. My school tells us if we're doing it as well as a lot more. In fact, this must be the first time in Australia <clears throat> that a major review has been accompanied by data which tells us if the review has got it right and uh, if we're doing what they recommended, they got it right, we're not doing it. Um, so let's see, now first we have to confess that Bernie Shep and I burrow into the my school data for two reasons. Firstly, our findings can have an impact. Secondly, it's a selfish reason. We watch as our framework, in our careers, and he's a, he's, he was a principal in Sydney also, um, he was a school leader, not principal, okay. Um, he was a school leader in Sydney, and uh, we could see how our framework of schools was changing in very reg regressive ways. We could see how it was impacting on students and schools and communities. <clears throat> and now we have the evidence to show this. <clears throat> now I'm going to show you much of this evidence. There are about 20 graphs, but I've actually simplified them to show you the main trends. Um, the, the original graphs can be found in a document we produced called Uneven Playing Field, uh, issued by the Centre for Policy Development. Um, I have a copy I should wave around, but uh, I want to start with equity. Now you can look at equity from two perspectives. One is the social justice perspective. That is, we should not have an education system where a child's outcomes are determined mainly by their family and circumstances. Or as my co-author Jane Caro puts it, whether they have membership or otherwise of the Lucky Sperm Club. <coughs> That's Jane. She writes like that. I, I don't. Um, but that won't sway the big end of town. Money does. Inequity incurs Inequity incurs big school costs and, and uh, big downstream costs as we try to patch up the families uh, and the kids have missed out. Creating school equity also costs, but not nearly as much. So how do we shape up? I'm moving right along. How do we shape up on the equity measure? Well, Australia is around the OECD average. <clears throat> and this graph was in Gonski's report. Now, so this is what I'm doing to simplify the graphs. The vertical scale is level of achievement. Don't worry about the measure. The horizontal scale is level of advantage. Australia's social gradient. There's Australia in the purple. In the off pink. No. <laughs> in, in the uh, striking colour. Um, Australia's um, 
equity <coughs> gradient is very steep compared with these other countries. There's a greater link between equity and level of advantage. That's weak equity. That's not a good place to be. And my school data also, also shows this relationship between achievement and advantage. The, the, the scatter graph, which is the next graph, it lines up, again, simplify the scales, it lines up uh, NAPLAN against Ixia and shows this quite a close relationship. As you know, Ixia is the my school measure of each school's level of socio-educational advantage. The blue trend line <coughs> shows our equity grading in 2010. The red one shows it just four years later. Now to be able to measure trends like that over just four years to see a shifting equity gradient surprised the life out of us when we did that exercise. Now, <coughs> there are some variations not shown. Um, equity gradients are steeper. That is, equity is worse in secondary years rather than primary and in metropolitan areas rather than provincial areas and rural. Interestingly, you know, we're concerned about our kids' achievement in rural areas. Equity is actually better. But of course, equity gradients are steeper where you have choice of schools. Um, and it's just interesting too, Victoria actually shows up reasonably well um, uh, relative to the other states. <clears throat> now to find out why we have poor and worse equity, I'm going to show you a snapshot of other trends on my school. First of all, <clears throat> I want to explain. A lot of my school data is, is reported on a state by state basis. But we find out more if we compare not by states, but by two or three large Ixia blocks of schools. Schools with advantaged kids, ones enrolling the more disadvantaged, and sometimes the ones in the middle. In other words, high, low and middle Ixias. And Ixia is the game changer in our analysis of schools. Let's look at the schools. Let's look to see how schools are changing over time and how big they are. This graph shows um, which schools are growing and which ones aren't. The red line, the blue line rather, are the um, higher Ixia schools. The red line are lower Ixia schools. These schools are rolling more of the strugglers. Uh, the, blue, the higher Ixia schools are growing, the lower Ixia schools are treading water. Now these are the averages across Australia, a huge sample. But it does vary from place to place, I have to say. But leaving the numbers aside, that could describe Melbourne. And we know that because all this work was done a decade and a half ago by Stephen Lamb and, uh, and uh, Richard Tees. <clears throat> it also describes Sydney. And what it does suggest is the student movement between schools is mainly a climb up, climb up the school socio-educational socio status ladder something which certainly reflect, reflects what research tells us about school choice. Now we can get some confirmation of this from my school. My school divides kids up into four quarters. Q1 and Q2 are the more advantaged kids, and Q3, oh, sorry, Q1 and 2 are the less advantaged kids, Q3 and 4 are the higher. Now of course, on average across Australia, the kids spread 25, 25, 25, 25. But of course that varies enormously, as you know, from school to school. Let's see how they're spread and how this spread is changing in our higher and lower Ixia schools. What's happened is that the percentage of top half kids by advantage in the advantage schools is going up. The concentration of these of the of the top half kids in the less advantage schools. Is, is going down. So in other words, advantage schools, that you can see how the picture of advantage schools are growing and harvesting more of the advantaged. Low SES, SEA schools are shrinking and advantage is further concentrating in these schools. That's what Konsky said. That's the core of our problem. If, measure, if measurable student achievement was increasing while this was going on, it wouldn't matter. So how do our two groups of schools compare in their NAPLAN scores over time? <clears throat> there are three ways of measuring this. 
Um, um, Bernie and I have shied away from measuring raw NAPLAN scores because NAPLAN <laughs> test results vary from year to year in ways that are often hard to explain, I can't say. So what we do is that we rank schools and compare ever-changing ranks. And it's clear that there's an ongoing divergence. Oops, let's get to the graph, Chris. There's an ongoing divergence between the high and um, <coughs> low uh, SES schools. Now, it's not dramatic, but it's consistent. And that, again, is the fact that it is measurable over a short span of years really amazed us. Now, of course, it's also possible to use ICSIA in relation to other measures of student achievement, and you show the same thing. I've done that in New South Wales, and uh, I looked at student achievement in the VCE, I looked at the uh, over 40 scores in the VCE, uh, the changes between 2003 and 2011 for various groups of schools, and it was quite clear that lower exit schools have a reducing share of these high scores. <clears throat> so to recap, leaving aside what goes on inside schools, Australia's big problem is the gap between them. We have a quantitative and qualitative shift in enrolments and a growing achievement gap. So in other words, what we're doing, we are compounding disadvantage, and this is impacting on student achievement. And that's exactly what Gonski said. Um, in, I had lunch with a very high profile um, corporate funder of schools um, um, not long, a few, few days ago, and basically I said to him, look, you're the sort of person that believes in parachuting the best teachers into the struggling schools. And we all believe in that. <clears throat> but at the very same time, the most aspirant kids are going out the back door. So the task that those teachers face is much, much more difficult. The chances of lifting the kids in these schools becomes harder unless we apply solutions to the whole framework of schools. Now, <clears throat> most of the gaps I've shown are evident within each sector, and especially recently, incidentally, within public education systems. <coughs> Over the last decade or so, public schools have been increasingly able to discriminate in enrolment practice. I went from being principal of one that couldn't to principal of one that could. <coughs> uh, visiting, I think they're called inspectors in those days, that dates us, Peter, I'm sure. Um, uh, said, when I was in the new school, he said, he said, you're doing really well now. No, I don't often ask people to leave the school. Um, and of course, in New South Wales, we have four dozen selective schools. So we turn discrimination into an art form. <clears throat> um, mind you, any school that charges fees is a selective school. Um, of course, the ultimate uh, school victims, the ultimate school victims of the choice process and enrolment discrimination lie at the bottom of the school food chain. And they are almost always public schools because they alone must be available to every child under every circumstance. So yes, there are low fee, relatively low as Catholic schools, not many, because our sample size disappears when you get below 950 almost, <clears throat> but they always draw, they can always draw kids from many of your schools. Now there are, couple of side, there are a couple of side effects of this. One is the fact that our framework of schools now represents a very distinct socio-educational ladder. <clears throat> you've long known this if you've been in schools for a number of decades, but now we can show it in very different ways. The schools on the left of the ladder, they're still getting better as well. Okay. Getting better as up and up. <clears throat> The schools on the left of the ladder are stacked in the way they are, mainly because of geography. The schools on the right are stacked uh, because of the way school choice operates in Australia. Now, <clears throat> the average exit dif differences between the sectors may not seem great, but most schools fall between 950 and 1150, so they are great. But the other side of discrimination and choice is found in increasing socio-educational disconnect between schools and their communities. Let me show you. <clears throat> this, this next graph looks at schools in ICSIA bands. 
there's a group of schools below 800, between 8 and 900, 900 and 1,000, 1,000, 1,100, so on. Now, what I've done, <coughs> I've compared the ICSIA, the socio-educational ranking, oh, sorry, profile of the school with the socio-educational, or actually socio-economic, but we've done it, we've done an analysis that is certainly viable, certainly valid, the, the socio-educational slash economic profile of the place where the school is located. Now, in our advanced, in our high ICSIA school, the ICSIA value of the school population is well above the ICSIA, or markedly above the ICSIA value of the equivalent value of the community where the school is located. And if we go through the other schools, we find that in fact, as you get down to the more disadvantaged schools, their enrolment is far more disadvantaged than the place in which they're located. That has huge implications. You know, I, you know, I, I heard the previous speaker and I think it was wonderful, but you know, can we talk about schools as being the centres of their community in the same way that we could 30 or 40 years ago? I don't think so. <coughs> um, I want to move on to school funding because funding both reflects and creates many of our current problems. There are so many funding anomalies in our framework of schools, it's hard to know where to begin. Funding, now funding data on my school is two years old, but trends are very apparent. In a recent story, in a recent piece we wrote for Inside Story, um, Bernie and I showed schools in Albury, Wodonga. They were wonderful examples of government schools out of sync from state to state. And they're a wonderful example of non-government schools just out of sync, full stop. Um, but I want to start with a few. I want to start with a few um, examples of what's happening. And when we talk about funding, we only talk about dollars per student, um, gross dollar figures on schools. No matter what they're doing, are useless. Aren't you over the politicians who say we spend up to million dollar, <laughs> whatever? <coughs> um, and when we talk about dollars, when we talk about public dollars, we only talk about combined state and federal government dollars. There's too many, uh, too much misleading information popping around about the Commonwealth does this and the states do that, whatever. Let's talk about all public dollars. Okay. <clears throat> Schools which are both publicly and privately funded, uh, that is, private schools, in effect, a better resource than public schools. Wasn't always the case. Um, interestingly, I mean, the argument for school fees in non-government schools had a certain validity when extra funds were needed to bring their funding up to the resourcing level of government schools. Um, what's happened now, of course, has gone completely upside down. <coughs> um, because what happens now, of course, is fee-based funding in non-government schools, all it does is act to increase the gaps between the sectors. Not only between government and non-government, but between independent... You can see the big difference between independent... Oh, hang on. A few explanations needed. Oops. Let me go back. At the top, uh, the top line is the total funding of independent schools per student. Over the and the way it's changed over time, the... the the reddish line is the government school total funding and the green line is the Catholic school total funding. I mean, the argument about school funding talks about Catholic schools that are less funded in total on government schools. There's this four or five year time lag that dominates the public debate. The, the, the beauty of my school is that it cuts that time lag down a, a reasonable amount. Now, but it's not just private funding. This next graph shows government dollars per student. And again, you can see some interesting trends. <coughs> Across Australia, government school funding for government schools up 15%, for Catholic and independent schools up 30%. Again, this is a relatively recent trend and it's really sort of catching people unawares if they notice. And there's a lot of people out there hoping we don't notice. Um, <coughs> so, another 
words, so what I'm saying here is that government funding as well as total funding is tipping the balance between the sectors. Now, this has especially been the case. Let's bring it closer to home. This is Victoria. Now, in fairness, the MySchool data, the most recent MySchool finance data is 2014. And, and there's been a substantial investment in public education, <coughs> as, as you know. Um, mind you, every time we raise these issues, one sector or state or another says, oh yes, but since then, <laughs> we've been doing this, that and the other. But since then, we find that every year's trend is very similar. Um, now, um, what, what all these graphs really mean is that the total funding and much fun public funding is not favouring the schools with the greatest need. Now, which are the schools with the greatest need? They're found in every sector. And, and the beauty, as we know, of Gonski's solution was that the funding mechanism and recommendations were sector blind. But there's no, nothing sector blind. Oh, incidentally, that's the Victorian trends up to 2014. There's nothing sector blind about where the need lies. Um, the uh, most advantaged students in, in independent schools, 47% of the enrollment, are the two top student quartiles. Um, and you can see, <coughs> you can see the government uh, bar graph on the left is a com almost a complete inverse, uh, certainly of the of the Catholic one, and a very very dramatically different to the um, <coughs> to the um, independent one. Now, just to summarise, I want to summarise a few. So we've been through half a dozen years where there's been no additional effort in Australia to fund schools on need. There's been no additional... Sure, needy schools are funded at higher levels, but Gonski recommended that additional funding favour need. Should it, it just hasn't happened, with perhaps New South Wales being one exception, and of course Victorian <coughs> in recent times. But along with this has been a continuation of the sector bias and funding on sector basis. It needn't have happened like that. It wasn't meant to have hap to happen like that. But of course, much of it is a legacy of two corruptions of school funding. One under the Howard government, and the other one as a result of Gillard's, Gillard's uh, no loser edict. Uh, and as recent media has shown, uh, some of the no losers have ended up becoming embarrassingly very big winners. <clears throat> so we're now in a period of rising concern over the overfunding of some schools. But there's one aspect I want to talk about, which you don't often hear about, which is potentially explosive. And to show you, I'm going to walk you through this graph. Now, look, <clears throat> this shows, there are considerable implications of what the graph shows. I want to walk you through it. We are constantly told that non-government schools only get 60% of the public funding going to government schools. The Federal Minister said that a month ago. For Catholic schools, for most Catholic schools, as shown here, it's over 90%. Now, let me explain the graph a little bit more. The blue columns, the red line, shows public funding of government schools shown as, not dollars, but 100% to naval comparisons, 100%. The blue columns show public funding of Catholic schools as a percentage of that red line, as a proportion of that red line. Okay. <clears throat> you can see down here on the left that over a passage of years, 2009 to 2014, some Catholic schools now get 124, 125% of the public funding going to public schools. Now that's not a fair comparison because there are very few Catholic schools down there and they're pretty needy. I don't know if they're that needy, but anyway, they're pretty needy. <coughs> the, in the background, you can see a very faint green bell curve. That's where most, most Catholic schools are located. So when I say most Catholic schools get between 90, in Australia, in Australia, get between 92, I think it is, and 97% of the funding going to government schools. 
That's most Catholic schools. That's where the, that's where the vital statistics lie. Now, so not 60%, it's over 90% for Catholic schools. Now, next year's my school data might show a change. But even if it changes, it actually changes nothing. Your principles of public schools, which must be available to everyone, in most cases, you, most cases, you cannot really discriminate. There's a raft of obligations and regulations and accountabilities which are yours alone. Not far from you is a private school with a lesser array of obligations, but in funding terms, it's not a private school at all. It's almost certainly a 90% plus government funded school. <clears throat> now this graph shows the Catholic funding situation on average across Australia. When we first did this, we were accused of cherry picking. This graph shows all the cherries, okay? In funding, there are significant variations between the states. Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on the schools in that uh, dotted uh, circle. That's where most Catholic schools are. I want to show you the situation in Victoria. That's the Victorian situation. You burst through the 100% barrier. <laughs> and it varies enormously between, from state to state. Because um, we, Bernie and I suggested we really need a stay <coughs> on non government school funding until this is sorted out. And, you know, we were accused of this. Actually, in South Australia, there's a de facto freeze on the state funding non-government schools. Um, so it, it sort of has happened. Um, the situation, you know, let me go to the situation regarding independent schools in Victoria. They've also received a huge boost. Um, that's combined state federal funding, but it's the state funding that's risen substantially. In fact, it's risen it's four times as much for independent schools as it has for government schools. That's your state government, up to 2014. <clears throat> now, um, I think, um, so independent schools, there's been a traditional gap between Catholic school funding and independent school funding based on the dirty deals done over several decades, maybe between the ALP and the Catholic Church. Um, look, look, and it's not about casting, but if I was, if I was um, uh, the head of the Catholic Education Commission, Oh boy, would I sure be knocking on the door, even after negotiations were finished, would I sure be knocking on the door and going back and asking for more? Uh, of course there are advocates for this. It's just that it's now become a matter of be careful what you wish for. And I think uh, behind closed doors, they must be very concerned. Now look, <clears throat> how does it look like on the ground? Well, I've had a closer look at government purse government per student funding of Victorian secondary schools around the middle exia range. And I've kept out the small schools because per student funding varies enormously when you get to really small schools. And I rate the schools in exia order to make sure I'm comparing apples with apples. And then I did a visual scan to make sure the comparisons were right. Three quarters of the Catholic schools, they ended up with a sample of 300, three quarters of the Catholic schools were funded in 2014 by governments ahead of similar ICSIA government schools. Three quarters of the Catholic schools were funded by government in Victoria, by governments in Victoria, ahead of your similar ICSIA government school. It's also the case, I should say, that around half of the government schools were funded by governments ahead of similar ICSIA government schools. It is likely that possible overfunding of government schools in some cases is an anomaly. But the overfunding of private schools by governments ahead of similar government schools is not an anomaly, it's a travesty. Now Bernie and I first raised this two years ago. <coughs> the non government speak groups were very, were very um, hostile. And I've got to tell you, <laughs> Um, in Victoria, you've got some of the more hostile non-gov peak groups I've ever seen. A dear friend of mine um, called them the Taliban of the school sector. <laughs> um, 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 uh, it's, um, 
The point is that even if their funding was 80% of your schools, such levels of funding by public funding are not compatible with the significant differences between the obligations of the public and private sector. It makes a moment. In fact, the next piece I'm going to write is just going to be called The Vanishing Private School. Because in funding terms, we no longer have private schools in Australia. If we ever did. Well, I suppose we did until Goulburn in 1962. Now, Bertie and I elaborate on these issues in, um, in our, I'll show you my website in a minute. <clears throat> on, on, a, on, a, on a global scale, what we have here is uniquely absurd. Now, put your hand up if you've attended an ICP conference, or, you know, you're going to yeah. Now, did you have the same experience I did when they asked you a little bit more in depth about Australia's schools, and you said, you, you tried to explain the funding, they look at you in absolute puzzle, they can't understand. And the usual response is, you do what? Um, the challenge now <clears throat> to the non-government sector is how on earth do you justify this? The opportunity for the public sector is to seek a rebalance, if there ever was indeed a balance. The immediate need is to find a politician who won't run away from you when you show them all this. Even the Greens, the Green leadership, don't want to know. Um, the recent airing of overfunding of high fee schools does matter, but it tends to be a distraction from that. The, the problem is goes right through the system. <clears throat> I want to show you one last graph. Um, here's a portion. Here's a portion of the graph. And I want to do, do this to show, the, explain the columns. The three columns on the left show for government schools their government funding, their total funding, and their NAPLAN results. Now, these columns are set at 100% to enable comparisons with other sectors. The three columns next to them show the same for Catholic schools. Government funding, total funding, and NAPLAN. Notice how their total funding is higher, <clears throat> and even higher again for independent schools. But this group of schools are around the middle ICSIA level. Let's see what it looks like for higher ICSIA groups of schools. Okay, the government funding falls off, as it should, but private funding goes through the roof. But for what? Because student achievement, as measured by NAPLAN, hardly varies between the sectors. We have a massive overinvestment by governments and by parents in advantage kids for poor results. Now, there's the other end of the easy scale. <clears throat> and the argument always is, and I understand this, and I understand the passion behind it. If I pay school fees, then everybody can go jump. It's my business. I've made that decision for my kids. Let's imagine. But the problem is, the question we should ask, is it a wise investment for governments? Is it the best investment for governments to be partners in arrangements that worsen equity when there's clearly a need and a better investment at the other end of the easier scale? That's the question we should be asking. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> where to from here? Um, my school will be a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> um, the data shows Gonski, that Gonski got it right. It shows that we shouldn't be talking about a post-Gonski era. We should go back and just do Gonski. It, um, Implementing Gonski's recommendations would, have, recommendations would have reduced many of the anomalies. <clears throat> In the past, I often tried to predict our school future, um, basis of what my school tell, tells us. And what my school tells us, basically, I think these are almost likely to continue. And details are in our, 
now with various publications. Um, I won't conclude, because I did so at the beginning. Um, we've tried to elevate some of these issues in the public debate, but there are many who are working equally hard to make them go away. It shouldn't have come to, it shouldn't have come to someone five years after Gonski standing up and seeming to reignite the sector wars. It shouldn't, it shouldn't come to that. It didn't have to come to that. But it has come to that because we didn't implement all of Gonski's recommendations. <clears throat> um, so who's going to talk about it? It's just us. It's just you and me. Um, the union, bless them, they're very shy. They've had a very disciplined but a very blinkered approach to, to Gonski. I've got to say, Gonski equals dollars. How many Gonskis did your school get? You know, all this sort of stuff. There's much, much more. <clears throat> the city in me suggests that all we'll do in Australia in the next year or two is come up with a new rationale to explain the inexplicable or to justify the inexplicable. We've been doing that for 30 or 40 years, so why stop now? So on that, I'll bring my thoroughly miserable presentation to an end. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Um, Tim Lunt, Sunshine College. My ex is 9.21. Um, I'm trying to work out how we go from the moral side of things to influence a government into changing their mind. Um, morality doesn't seem to work. Um, I'm just wondering if you've done any work against salaries expended in independent schools per student in staffing terms against what happens in government schools. Because what I believe is we need to push a efficiency um, argument that they're overfunded because, you know, when I go to my school website, I can see schools with uh, per thousand kids, they've got four times more staff than I've got. And to me, that's just an efficiency issue. Like you're saying, when that plan results are the same, and yet there's this expenditure in salaries for staffing that's just atrocious. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> My school doesn't tell us about specific money going to teacher salaries. <clears throat> so we can't do that with My School data. Um, but clearly the pattern of investment, especially in capital investment, shows that a substantial amount of money, including money directed from recurrent funding, goes into capital. The reason goes, the reason it goes into capital. And the reason the Catholic education system funds its high ICSIA schools quite well is because they're an arms race. It's not only a resources arms race, yes, it's a teacher salary arms, all that sort of stuff. I, you've got, you've got to be, be careful, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, yes, their the, the salaries are high, or, or in ways we can't easily measure. And you, you're right. It doesn't make a great difference to the results. Be careful here, we could be feeding into the argument that says more money doesn't improve results. Whereas the reality is a lot of that money is not, doesn't go into teacher effectiveness, it goes into um, bells and whistles. But you know, the, the other point you raise is really, really important. I spent half a decade talking about the moral argument. What Bernie and I are doing, we're pushing that to one side. The big end of town is not impressed by the moral argument, the equity argument. Now we're talking about effectiveness, efficiency, and delivery for the dollar. Thank you. We might let you sit down for that. <laughs> Save your voice.